Big Thomas Simmons, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Lovely to join you, Paul. Thank you for having me. It looks lovely there in Wales. You've got a great bookshelf. <laughs> uh, I miss Wales badly at the moment. What, what's it like? Well, as of today, it's a, be- it's a beautiful sunny day. I'm speaking to you from the northern part of my constituency here in Torvine, where it's just a-, a blessing to live, frankly. It's, as you know, Paul, beautiful scenery. And out enjoying it in the sun, there are a few things better. Oh, you're making me homesick. I mean, you've been travelling back and forth between London and Torvine during the pandemic, as of course you're entitled to, you're allowed to because you're doing that for work. Have you noticed much of a difference between the way people are behaving in Wales and the the way they're behaving in in England in terms of the the pandemic? No, no, and I've actually seen that same sense of togetherness in London and indeed in Torvine, people coming together. And there are some quite remarkable stories, Paul, many of which are untold, if you like, of people assisting with food banks uh, and other things to help others. I think the resilience, but also the generosity of the British people has been in evidence both in London and indeed in Torbine, and I've seen that. And it's been a quite inspirational thing, actually, at a very difficult time. I'm just waiting to find out from Mark Drakeford when I can go and see my parents. Can you just like put in a word for me or something, Nick? About, I'll, do about my best, Paul. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right, let's get you settled into Downing Street now because, uh, of course, the pandemic is one thing you'd have to deal with as Prime Minister. So we want to envisage you behind that Downing Street door and get you settled in. So we always ask a few questions just at the beginning of the podcast to, to help you envisage yourself there. Firstly, what is the one item that you would take with you from home if you became Prime Minister? Right. Well, I would I would think that it would be very useful to look at the experiences of previous Labour prime ministers. So I'd like to take my own book on Clement Attlee, if that was possible, because I can then look back to certain situations that he found himself in and how he reacted. But you might allow me to cheat slightly, Paul, because I've got a biography of Harold Wilson that will be out later, I hope, this year. So I'm wondering if I can perhaps print out the draft of that and, you know, fold it into the pages. So I've got two Labour Prime Ministers as a guide for me as I uh, come into number 10. How have you found time to write a book and be Shadow Home Secretary? I'm always amazed by people who find time to write books. Uh, Partly because I'd done a lot of the research and the groundwork for it before I took on the role. But the second answer is very early mornings, uh, which is frequently the case for me anyway. I've always been an early riser, so it's good to be up starting work. And it's surprising what you can achieve in a single day when you go to early. Okay, so books are your personal item. Uh, Secondly, what is the first takeaway you're going to order as Prime Minister? Because presumably the first night you're not going to want to cook. No, I'm not going to want to cook. I will just go for my simple favourite, which is uh, chicken tikka masala. That would be lovely with uh, some boiled rice. It'd be a very good way, I think, to have a pleasant evening in Downing Street. Lovely. And who's the first person that you'd call as Prime Minister? Well, I think it would have to be the, the transatlantic call to President Biden to speak about his victory uh, as a progressive in the United States, and also to speak to him about how he ran a campaign that brought a very divided nation together, bringing people together, obviously, so uh, important to me. And to speak about that, I think, would be uh, a very good start and a very first good first phone call. Okay, great. So let's talk a bit about your path to power now as Prime Minister. So you were born in Torvine, as you've already been talking about, in South Wales, brought up in Blynavon. Your father was a steel worker and industrial chemist, and your, your mum was a secretary. You went to the local state school before studying politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford University. And then after university, you went on to become a barrister, an academic, and also an author, as you've just said, of political histories. And you were elected as MP for Torvine in 2015, working your way through various shadow portfolios to become shadow Home Secretary under Keir Starmer. So let's go back to your childhood to begin with. So son of a steel worker, I mean, that sounds like a pretty typical Welsh upbringing. So maybe we shouldn't be too surprised by your politics. Is that where they kind of come from? My politics definitely comes from the place I grew up. And they come from, if you like, Margaret Thatcher's government's politics, but I'm sure not in the way that she would ever have intended. And it was growing up in this valley I'm speaking to you from at the moment, 
in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. And what I saw was a government that was happy to just throw communities to one side, to abandon communities. Uh, one form of employment, heavy industry disappearing, nothing done to replace it, no positive industrial strategy. And what I saw was the effect, first of all, if you like, on you know my, my father's generation, seeing people who had tremendous skills to offer, but entered periods of unemployment. And then in you know, my own generation, what that did to life chances uh, down the generations uh, as well. And it made me really determined to want to do something about it. And I go back to a conversation I had with my grandmother, uh, Alwyn Thomas, a, a, after whom my, my old daughter's second name is Alwyn after her. And conversation I had with her as a teenager when I used to say that you know, this was a problem, I thought this was awful. And she said, well, if you want to change things, the only way to do that is to go into politics. And it was a very sound piece of advice that I followed. So would that be your earliest political memory then, do you think, Nick? Or was there, was there something else that's really, that was really kind of seminal for you from your childhood? What, what is seminal for me are my conversations with my grandmother. And they were happening from, you know, a young age, looking back at a really young age. You, you know, I was looking at the world around me, looking at the things that were happening, seeing the impact, if you like, of the Thatcher government policies on the valley. And my grandmother was, she was a, a great reader. Uh, you know, a lot of my love of reading and books comes from her. She also was extraordinarily determined. Her lifetime's ambition was to become a nurse. And she actually achieved it at the age of 56. You know, she was sent away at, as a teenager to London to work in service, as often was the case in those days. Came back to the Valley, had various jobs, but never lost sight of that driving ambition. So she was inspirational for me and she gave me that interest in politics when I was very young that never really left me. So if I look back, it probably isn't a single conversation with her that I would say was the moment that, that I decided this was what I wanted to do, but it was a series of conversations over a number of years that really did give me that, that firm determination. And do you think that's where your, your kind of drive and ambition came from too, aside from the fact that it ended up being channeled into politics? Because obviously you went to Oxford and, and not a lot of pe people from Wales go to Oxford. It's still quite underrepresented as a nation at, uh, at Oxbridge. Um, I mean, did you feel at, at home there? Did it feel like quite a sort of alien step coming from, from Torvine and ending up in those, the dreaming spires of Oxford? It, it never really did. And I, and I was someone who I went to Oxford when I was 18 and uh, then remained obviously after I graduated and, and became a tutor and I always found the experience of being at Oxford you know meeting people not just from around the country but studying with people from all around the world proved to be a, you know a great experience and ended up teaching you know the foundations of diplomacy course which was you know speaking to and educating trainee diplomats who went on to all sorts of, sorts of countries around the world. So that was a great experience. I never really felt out of place. It always felt comfortable. But what I did notice was that, you know, I remain extremely close to my, to my childhood uh, friends. You know, my childhood best friend hasn't changed. I was uh, speaking to him only earlier this week. But I did look around me and see that, you know, yes, I, I was very lucky. It was able to, to go to Oxford university from state school here in Wales, but there aren't enough other people who do that. And one of the things I did when I was at Oxford was a lot of outreach work, trying to encourage more people to apply, which is one of the big issues, people thinking that this path simply isn't for me. And that is something we've still got to change quite dramatically, I think. Okay, so as Prime Minister now, skipping through the the, the life a few stages and getting you into number 10 again. Um, you've written about prominent Welsh Labour figures and you've just been talking about some of the books you've taken to Downing Street, but who would you kind of model yourself on as Prime Minister, do you think? Well, look, my my political hero is and always will be an Iron Bevan, and I you know, was very lucky to write that biography that I've uh, written uh, of Nye. I should just I should just tell you actually just for a moment, Paul, the story of how I came to write that book because there is mm. a moment where I did come to write it, and it was when I was at school and I wrote a letter to Michael Foot, and I asked Michael Foot just for a, a quote really for a history project I was doing in school, and to my surprise, a letter came back inviting me 
to visit him at Pilgrim's Lane in London. Lived number 66, Pilgrim's Lane. He'd got the street renamed after his native Plymouth, you know, the Pilgrim Fathers. And I knocked on the door and I went in to see Michael, went into the sitting room, had a lovely afternoon, cup of tea, cake. And he said to me, so there should be a modern day biography of an Aaron Bevan and you should be the person to write it. Now, at that point, at that point, I felt on top of the world because one of my political heroes had told me to write a book about another mm -hmm. of my political heroes. I went out into the hallway and Michael's wife, Jill, sidled up to me. He said, you've had a good afternoon with Michael. And I said, it's been wonderful. She said, you do realize though, don't you, that he flatters everybody he meets? I said, okay. And she added, he works out the very best way to flatter them. So whether it was flattery or whether it was sincerity, I never really knew, but it gave me the idea. And I went on obviously to write the book, but I think I would like to model on both an Iron Bevan and Clement Attlee in this sense. They mm. harnessed both a real determination to tackle inequality and poverty. In Bevan's case, what he'd seen in the South Wales coalfield in the 1920s. In Attlee's case, what he'd seen as a social worker in the East End of London. But they combined it with this sense that you had to be in government, you had to do something about it. And so that sense of both a burning desire to tackle injustice, but actually getting into power and getting things done, I think, give me great inspiration in my political career. And we should just recap for anyone listening to the podcast who perhaps isn't familiar with these characters, although I'm probably patronising people terribly because they're all very famous. But obviously, Nairon and Bevan founded the NHS, Clement Attlee, former Labour Prime Minister, Michael Foote, former Labour leader, uh, who didn't do so well, actually. Yeah. Um, but... Clement Attlee certainly and and Irene Bevan, you know, they came up with pretty radical policies, or at least sort of very ambitious policies. What would your ambition be then as Prime Minister? Is there something on that scale that you think that you could do that would really sort of revolutionise uh, the way this country works? Look, my my burning uh, ambition in politics is to address poverty. Is to address the poverty that I grew up with, and there there isn't a single policy lever. If there was one, believe me, I would want to pull that lever to to deal with poverty. But as we all know, that there's a huge variety of things you need to do cross government to deal with that. You know, about it's about investment in not just education for young people, but lifelong education is so important. Job chances that are important and just as an iron bevan said good health is so so important to be able to live a fulfilled life so it's about that investment in the nhs as well so it's about if you like real reform in a number of areas but the thing that drives me more than anything is that tackling of poverty and inequality okay and as prime minister you, you would be able to pursue some of your own priorities but of course you also get buffeted by events and we've had an incredible week uh, as i speak to you today in the news, there have just been just kind of enormous events really this week. Let's let's talk about the one that's currently in the news today, which is the disappearance of Sarah Everard, uh, who went missing in, in Clapham, South London. We've got to be a bit careful here because we want this podcast to stand the test of time. And obviously there might be a court case after all of this. So we don't want to get into the, to the sort of legal details of, of the case, but a Met police officer has been arrested as I'm speaking to you at this moment on suspicion of, of murder. So this is created a, a huge outpouring from women about the way they feel about their own safety walking home. And so perhaps if we talk about the broader issue here, I mean, what do you think that you could do as Prime Minister to, to end the fear that, that women feel in a huge majority, about 97%, I think, in a recent survey, said they, they'd suffered harassment, which is just extraordinary. I think the first thing we have to do is to acknowledge the scale of the problem. I mean, the statistic you just gave there, Paul, of 97% speaks to the scale of this problem. But truly, right across society, is that recognised? That's the first point. Let's acknowledge the scale of the problem. The second issue, and I think, and I, think I, I am speaking to you as, as a man. Uh, I ha am not speaking from the experiences and some of the extraordinarily powerful testimonies we've been hearing over the last 24 hours of experiences that women have had. And I think that that is where there is a real issue here in terms of change and huge cultural change. Why should it be that a woman is told you should go out at night, be careful about being out on your own, or put a, you know, a key, the old story about, you know, put a, a car key between your fingers mm. so if everyone, anyone tried to attack you, why on earth should women be adjusting their behavior 
because they are likely to face danger. Surely what we need to be doing is on the other side of this. Why are men causing danger? Why are men putting women in fear in this way? And the answer to that must lie in a systemic thing around education, but also a national discussion we need to have, both acknowledging the scale of that problem and recognizing too the scale of the change that needs to occur. Perhaps it's a, a huge sort of awareness campaign, isn't it? Because I think some some men have have pushed back on good old social media um, because they're sort of suggesting, you know, you can't brand all men as, as harassers and we're not all the same. But actually, I think there, there probably is a, a huge amount of ignorance among men about the way women feel. I mean, I certainly didn't understand the, the true scale of it. I remember some colleagues, we did a, we did a report on ITV News a couple of weeks ago about women not feeling, feeling able to go out running. And I just hadn't thought about it because I guess because I'm not a woman and I haven't had that conversation with a woman, I wasn't aware just how intimidated some women feel going out and about running. And so perhaps it, it partly is, is an awareness thing that men just need to know about this so that they can adjust their behavior and, and look out for women a bit more. It's also a recognition, I think that relates to what you've just said, about how pervasive this is. You know, I was discussing, it, it's a truly awful case, by the way, and our thoughts are with all of Sarah Everard's family uh, and friends at this time. It's just unimaginable what they're going through. As you can imagine, I was discussing this with, uh, with my wife last night, and we were commenting on the horror of the case. And she was saying to me that, you know, it's something that's in the back of her mind every time she goes out after dark, not just one night, not just a few nights a year, but every time she walks out after dark, she's always got in the back of her head to be careful. Now, we shouldn't have a situation in our society where women are going out and being put in fear of their own safety. And I think mm. recognizing how widespread that is, is fundamental to recognizing the scale of the change that we need right across society to deal with it. And of course, you've got two daughters and also a son. Do you worry about your daughters? I mean, they're probably quite young, aren't they? But do you worry about them when they get older, going out on their own and, and you know, potentially getting into trouble? Oh, it, it, it's a huge worry for me. My, my daughters are 11 and 8, so my oldest daughter is obviously just about to move into the teenagers. So, of course, it's a, it's a big concern. I mean, it's not, a, you know, it's not a worry that's, Sort of exclusive to me as, as as a father. I think this is a widespread worry that, you know, is right across society about personal safety. And I think it's something that we have to, at this precise moment as well, in this darkest of moments when we see this awful Sarah Everard case, but let it be a moment as well that can be a catalyst for change going forward right across society. And that wasn't the, the only big moment that, that may be a catalyst for change across society this week, because we had the Harry and Meghan interview on Sunday night in the US, Monday night in the UK, which already feels like a long time ago, because so much has happened since then. I, I don't know whether you watched the interview, um, but I just wonder where your sympathies lie with that whole issue of race in, in, in society and whether you felt sympathy with, with Meghan or whether... You feel sympathy with the royal family. You've been accused of potentially harbouring some kind of racist tendencies themselves. Well, look, I think in the in the first instance, let's just take that that issue because what's uh, alleged to have been said, what uh, Meghan has has commented on, and Harry's commented on, is clearly, totally, and utterly uh, unacceptable. And I've seen the statement that the royal family has put out to say that that matter will. Uh, now be investigated and clearly that is the appropriate thing to do it doesn't matter who made a remark like that whether it's uh, you know if such a remark was made whether it's a member of the royal family or whether it's anybody else I think clearly our reaction to that uh, needs to be the same but my my sympathies here are a more general form of sympathy if you like Paul because I see uh, a family I see you know uh, as Prince Charles there's the two sons mm. and listening to what uh, you know, was spoken about in terms of the, the clear breakdown in the family relationships. It just uh, filled me really with an enormous uh, sense of sadness that here's a family that clearly at one point was extremely close, but now has these uh, significant problems. And I think when you see that in any family, you feel a sense of sympathy for it, of course. 
But it was interesting, though, the way the politics sort of developed down to it this week, because the prime minister was very clear that he didn't want to be drawn into the into the row. Keir Starmer took a bit of a, a different approach and said that there should be an investigation into the to the claims of racism within the royal family. I think we all kind of know, though, watching it, you know how we how we felt and who we who we sort of sympathised with. I mean, I, I guess you know, are you are you do you feel able to tell me? Do you, do you do you feel more sympathy with Meghan or do you feel more sympathy with with the Queen and the royal family? Well, I'm not sure. You know, there's a sort of there's a competition in my mind about who's got the most sympathy. I and mean, of course, I felt sympathetic watching the bits of the. I didn't watch the interview uh, straight through, but I've seen you know quite a lot of bits of it. And of course, I felt great sympathy uh, watching it for for Harry and Meghan. But as I say, they are part of a family and you can't help but feel sympathy for the whole situation that's ended up arising here. And of course, Meghan in particular, when she spoke about mental health and when she spoke about suicide, I thought that was extraordinarily powerful, by the way, that someone with that uh, position, someone that well known, was brave enough to speak about it. And I did think that was extraordinarily moving. And I had very deep sympathy for what she was saying about that. Did you have any sympathy with Piers Morgan? <laughs> who, my colleague who resigned from Good Morning Britain this week, because he definitely didn't have any sympathy with Meghan and he was pretty outspoken about it. Well, I think I think um, Piers Morgan's well capable of looking after himself <laughs> without my uh, sympathy, frankly. But uh, I thought that, I actually thought that Megan speaking about suicide really struck a chord with a lot of other people around the country as well who've found themselves in a situation. And I hope that at the very least, what that will do is encourage people to talk to others about what they're going through. Let's talk about one last issue now in, in, in this sort of equality space, isn't it, really, that we're talking about? And that's conversion therapy, because I spent a lot of my time this week reporting on the resignation of three government advisors who've all accused the government of creating a hostile environment for LGBT people. And, and one issue at the heart of that is the fact that the government had promised a ban on so-called conversion therapy, this attempt to change or suppress someone's sexuality or their gender identity. The government had promised that ban. It hasn't been forthcoming. We're sort of two and a half years on from the original promise now. And the campaigners and, and these particular advisors have, have become frustrated by that. And I just wondered, because you've got a legal background, you know, what I'm hearing from the government is it's very difficult to ban this practice, partly because some of it involves prayer and spiritual guidance, which is sort of a grey area. Can you legislate in that kind of religious space? I mean, as someone who, who covers clearly home affairs and as someone with a legal background, do you personally think it is, it is possible in law to, to ban conversion therapy? It, it absolutely is possible, and that is what the government should be doing. And I don't find the government's arguments at all convincing on this. You can clearly define things in legislation and indeed set out parameters that the courts then apply. That's a very common thing in legislation going back generations. And I do believe the government has a blind spot here. We've had a consultation since, what, 2018? Mm -hmm. Nearly three years. Boris Johnson promised to outlaw conversion therapies in what was it, you know, at least going back to last year, if not a lot, yeah, a, a last July. time before that. Indeed, July last year. So we what we know is that the government is dragging its feet. It seems to have a blind spot on this issue. The government should just get on with it, put the ban in place. It's an abhorrent practice and it shouldn't be something that's lawful. Do you have any concerns, though, about religious freedoms in, in that context? You know, how do you stop then a ban from infringing on those religious freedoms? You know, just sitting with someone and maybe saying, look, I can see you're struggling with your sexuality. Let me pray for you. I mean, it's, I've covered this a lot. So perhaps this is unfair because I've probably looked at it in far more detail than, you, than you've had time to, Nick. But it's quite a grey area, I suppose. And I'm just, I'm just fascinated by how you would actually legislate to ban it. But, but every, every piece of law is about an action and an intention, right? So you would, in this law as in any other law, you'd look at the particular action and what the person who was acting, if you like, intended to do. See, I don't think that this is a difficult thing. There are so such a myriad, if you like, of different areas where you have these balances you have to strike in law, where you're trying to draw a line between what's lawful and unlawful. I actually think it is more than possible to do it in this context. And the government should absolutely be doing it. And people are calling on the government to act and dragging its feet in this way is not helping anybody.
Okay, well, look, if you ever get into, into government, then Labour is a, a bit of a way to go before it's sort of banging on the door of number 10. And we've got elections coming up in, in Wales and Scotland, of course, this year. And we've also got local elections in England and mayoral elections in England. What do you think a, a good performance would be for Labour in, in this year's elections? Well, look, speaking to you from Wales, we clearly want to re-elect the Welsh Labour government. I think it's a bit more difficult around the country because there are so many different elections going on. But here in Wales, Paul, as you know, we're absolutely firm about what we want to do. I believe Mark Drakeford has really excelled during the pandemic. I think that his attention to detail, that calm, vigilant approach really has been a great positive. And now it's about Welsh Labour here in Wales, building out of that on the NHS, on jobs. So here in Wales, we're absolutely looking to retain uh, the Welsh Labour government. It'd be unwise of me to set targets elsewhere because I think it is a, a very mixed picture in different parts of the country, different elections going on. But believe me, we'll be campaigning for every single vote in every part of the country. It's going to be quite an interesting test of Labour, isn't it? Because you have you know, the, the party's come a long way even, even since uh, last year. Um, under Keir Starmer's leadership, there's been quite a significant um, break with Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. So it, it will be an interesting test, won't it, of, of kind of how well things are going for Labour? It's taking place, though, in an extremely strange relationship, extremely strange situation. Keir Starmer has yet to give a speech to a room full of human beings. You know, most of Keir's speeches have actually been to a sole cameraman who, with the greatest respect to Keir, I'm sure his interest is in getting the frame of the photo right as opposed to listening to what's being said. So I think that we've got to view it in that context as well. This has not been in any sense what you'd expect to be an orthodox period of government and opposition. You know, we've quite rightly taken a constructive approach on the pandemic. We've been very critical. We've made suggestions like, for example, Keir Starmer making that suggestion of a circuit breaker for England back in the autumn of last year. We've supported the public health messaging because I think to try to have a rival message to stay at home would have been bad for the country, not in the national interest. So we have to bear that in mind as well, that they are taking place in very, very difficult and different circumstances, what we'd ordinarily expect. OK, well, look, we watched the results of those elections with interest, but we're almost out of time, Nick. So let's just do a quick fire round to finish <laughs> off with. Um, firstly, who would you rather have dinner with as Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn or Tony Blair? I've deliberately made those two extremes. I am, I am a unifier, Paul, so both. <laughs> You'd have, both, have them both round for dinner. Oh, that might be a bit awkward. Um, where would you go on holiday as Prime Minister? Well, I think this is a year to support the Welsh tourist industry. And particularly as Prime Minister, I think a Prime Ministerial, ministerial trip to the Gower Peninsula would be a very good idea. Correct answer. Um, <laughs> what song would you dance to at party conference? Well, I'll make a confession about songs. Uh, my, I always remember having the discussion with my wife about the first dance at our wedding, and I'm a very passionate Liverpool football fan, and she conceded in the end, I could have You'll Never Walk Alone, so I guess it would have to be Scarves Aloft, <laughs> You'll Never Walk Alone. Excellent. Uh, and what would your Downing Street pet be? Well, I, I'd have to take my dog with me. I think I've got Pippa, she's a... Border Collie Merle, and I think she'd be uh, very troubled and upset if I disappeared and didn't take her with me, so she'd have to come. Excellent. Uh, and lastly, Nick, would you ever want to be Prime Minister? I want to be the, the Home Secretary. That's what I'm after doing, Paul. And every day when I am working and I drive from where I am, about a mile from here was born the last Welsh Labour Home Secretary, who was... Roy Jenkins in the mid 1960s. Uh, so I think it would be fitting if Labour's next Home Secretary was not only from the same valley, but living in the same village. Okay, well, one step at a time, I guess, Nick, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll be asking you that question again in future. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been really interesting to talk to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for your time.